grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, today we want to continue our words about what God has to say about anger in His Word. Because we all deal with anger in our lives and also in the lives of, of others. And I want to begin this morning with some examples of anger and how that anger was managed. The first example is David Burke. His name was David Burke. He was a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines. He was caught pocketing $69,000 of in-flight cocktail receipts. He was fired by a supervisor. The following Monday, David Burke got on flight 1771 and was seated quietly in the back of the plane. It was a plane that also carried his former supervisor. At 22,000 feet, David Burke's anger exploded. This much we know. The pilot radioed from the cockpit. There is an emergency. There's gunfire in the aircraft. With that, Flight 1771 plunged to the earth. David Burke, his supervisor, and 40 other people died. Their bodies ripped apart and scattered in the southwest California desert. When they dug through the rubble, the investigators found a 44 Magnum with six skinned cartridges. That said something, but what said it all was what they found written on an air sickness bag in David Burke's own handwriting. Hi, Ray. It's ironic that we would both end up like this. I pleaded for mercy and for my family, remember? Well, I got none, and you'll get none also. Signed, David Burke. David Burke was an angry man, and much like Cain, and we talked about Cain last week, he didn't handle his anger very well. That's the first example. Second example, her name was Candy Leitner. One day in 1980, her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, was walking down a suburban street in Fair Oaks, California. Driving down that same street was a drunk driver. And in his drunkenness, he drove right up to the sidewalk and drove over Candy Leitner's daughter. The car crushed her beneath the wheels of this, his vehicle. At first, all Dandy Leitner could do, or Sandy Leitner, Candy Leitner could do, was to weep over the grievous loss, and of course she had tremendous anger. But in her frustration and grief, she started an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, an organization that was, has promoted legislation and awareness programs throughout our country. An organization that one expert estimates has saved already 30,000 lives. Candy Leitner was an angry woman. But she managed her anger in a different way than David Burke, didn't she? Two individuals, both angry. One of them caused much damage on other people's lives. The other one, spared lives. Last week we, we talked about the roots of anger and where anger comes from. We talked about the fact that anger is really a secondary emotion. And really anger begins with the frustrations that we have in our life. It begins with embarrassments we have in our life. It helps. It, 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 it comes from rejections that we have in our life. And so when we don't deal with the rejections, we don't deal with the embarrassment and those primary feelings, we tend to jump on the secondary one, which is anger. And oftentimes then, anger isn't handled properly. Well, today, we're going to talk about the emotion of anger, the fact that it's, it's not the problem. Anger is not the problem. The problem is the management of anger. 
Because there's a couple myths we want to talk about today. And the first myth is this, and you all know this, I think, and hopefully you do, and if you don't, I'm glad that to tell you this. Myth number one is, is that all anger is a sin. That's a myth. All anger is not a sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that anger in itself is a sin. It doesn't say that. It's what we do with the anger. That's where the sin comes in. In fact, most of the references to anger in the Bible are references to God's anger. There's more references to God's anger in Scripture than there is to man's anger. So anger in itself cannot be a sin because God doesn't sin. So it is possible to be angry and not sin. In fact, that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? It says it very, very plainly that that's the case. Ephesians chapter 4. Let me turn to that. Ephesians 4. Listen to this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. What God is saying is when you're angry, don't be sinning. Well, the implication here is simple, isn't it? It's plain. That it's possible to be angry and not sin. But we need to deal with the anger so we don't sin. The anger itself is not the sin. The sin comes in how we deal with the anger that we have. And that's why the Bible says, deal with your anger before the sun goes down. So that it doesn't turn into something which is sinful. In fact, I think there are four faces to anger. This is my thing, really. Uh, I think I'm right. But there's four faces to anger. The first face is what I call rage. Rage. You all know what rage is? It's that intense, short-fused, uh, what else? Uh, explosive uncontrolled anger, rage. It's that when you fly off the handle, in fact, uh, Will Rogers once said, people who fly into a rage seldom make a good landing. <laughs> that's true. Let me say it again. This is Will Rogers, not me. People who fly into a rage seldom make a good landing. They never make a good landing. God says to people who are possessed with rage, and I think that David Burke, the man we talked about, I think that was rage. His anger turned into rage. But God says very plainly it's in James chapter 1, verse 19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Slow to become angry. So that's the first face is rage. Second face of, of anger, I believe, is, is wrath. Wrath. Uh, that's an anger that wants to seek revenge. That's the anger that wants to get back. That's the anger that says, you did that to me, I'm going to do that to you. That's wrath. Somewhat like rage, but a little bit more subdued. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what I mean. That's the wrath. And of course, that's sin. And again, Scripture talks about that. In Psalm 37, verse 8. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil sin. So wrath is a second face of anger. The third face of anger, 
I call resentment. <clears throat> resentment. That's, that's where a person suppresses their anger and it grows on the inside. It builds up. It smolders there in the heart. It eventually turns to bitterness, self-pity. That's what happened to, to the oldest son uh, in, the, in the story of the prodigal son that, that Jesus told. Remember the older brother? Was filled with resentment against home. His father and his younger brother. The resentment was there. He, he resented his father because he didn't think his father should welcome the younger brother home again. Because of what he did. The older brother resented the younger brother because he got a reward for being bad. And he resented that. In fact, this is what Jesus, this is what the Bible says. Luke 15, verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. He refused to go in to the party that the father was having for his younger son because he had returned. The older brother had so much resentment, he did not want to join in with him. That too is a sin, resentment. But there's a fourth face to anger, I believe. And that's indignation. Indignation. It's an anger that rises up because of some injustice that was done. Somebody was being mistreated. In other words, it's an anger that's aimed at a problem rather than a person. It's anger for the right reason and expressed in the right way. It's a controlled anger that's meant to be corrective and constructive. That's the kind of anger that, that Jesus had. He was angry a lot, Jesus was. You, you go through the gospel sometime, see how many places it says Jesus was angry. But in each and every time, in every, every place, he was angry. It was against a problem that existed. Or a heart condition that existed among the people. One example is Mark 3, 5. Listen to this. Now the, the, the context of this is that Jesus was healing somebody. And the people were angry at Jesus because he was healing on the Sabbath. Here's what Jesus, he looked. This is Mark 3, 5. He looked around at them in anger. In anger says, Jesus in anger, and said, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand is completely restored. It's okay to be angry, but don't sin. Use your anger to do something constructive, something good. Zig Ziglar, you know who Zig Ziglar was, or is? I don't know if he's still around or not. But Zig Ziglar was a motivational speaker years ago. He tells the story. <clears throat> there was this swimming pool in Yazoo City, Mississippi, where he lived as a, as a boy. There was a swimming pool, but there was only one in Yazoo City, Mississippi. And the pool was right in the middle of a, a private uh, golf course. And so one day, Fig Ziegler, as a young boy, was swimming in that swimming pool. The manager came out and said, Are you the Ziegler kid? Do you have a membership here? And Zig says, No, I'm not a member here. My daddy isn't a member here. And so the manager took Zig and took him by the hand, roughly, Put him outside. Zig Ziglar, as a young kid, said he was so angry. And he said, Someday, I'm going to build a swimming pool that's bigger than this one. Well, years later, Zig Ziglar, writing in his book, says this about that incident. 
As a matter of fact, I left that swimming pool in tears. On that day, I made a strong statement, as children will sometimes make. I declared then and there that someday I was going to have a swimming pool bigger than that one in, in, in Mississippi. I said this in a moment of anger. Much later in life, because of God's blessings, when my career took off, my wife and I built a swimming pool in our backyard that's exactly one foot longer than the one in the country club in Yazoo City, Mississippi. You see what he did with his anger? He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't hurt anybody. See, there's a way to manage anger. Jesus managed his anger again and again and again. But more than that, more than that, if the facts were be to put on the table, when God looked at us, God looked at you, and he saw your sin, God was angry. The Bible tells us that his anger over sin. <coughs> But God chose to use that anger to do something as a blessing for all of us. But God did, and you know this, God put his anger upon Jesus, his own son, on the cross of Calvary. And there Jesus died, suffering because of the anger of God. Jesus took on God's anger, God's wrath upon himself. God himself dealt with his anger and he got it as a blessing to all of us. So, the first myth is all anger is a sin. All anger is not a sin. It can be managed in a constructive way. A second one, second myth, is this. A person doesn't look angry. If a person doesn't look angry, they're not angry. That's a myth. There are many, many people who are angry, but don't show it. Here's the truth. Anger wears many masks, many disguises. Here are some of the disguises. Maybe you'll identify some of these. An abundance of sarcastic humor could be a mask for anger. Or insulting others, in other words, being the Don Rickle of the workplace. Insulting others could be a mask, a disguise for anger. Or constant criticizing of others. Always putting others down could be a disguise for lots of anger. Or blaming others. Now these are all masks that anger can wear. Look at that list once more. Look at that list closely. Think of yourself. Do you see any masks of anger in your life? Are you covering up your anger with any of these masks that we have just mentioned? Because the truth again is, is we all tend to mask our anger. I mean, we're all guilty of this, some more, some less. We all try to hide our anger because we don't want people to know we're angry. So we'll will hide behind a mask. Have I convinced all of you? Hopefully. But here's some good news. Here's some great news. Jesus doesn't look at your mask. He looks beyond your mask. Jesus looks at your heart. And then you may say, well, oh, that's even worse. If Jesus knows, I mean, I'd rather have 
I'd rather have you see my mask than, than my heart. Oh no. Jesus sees your heart. And even though Jesus sees your heart, He loves you. He cares for you. He looks beyond the mask. He looks beyond the anger that you have. And He sees somebody there whom He has redeemed. He sees somebody there who He died for on the cross many, many years ago. That's Jesus. Yes, Jesus looks beyond the mask. He looks into the heart. And he sees a heart there that he loves and he cares for. See, God's anger was kindled because of, because of love. God was angry at man's sin, at your sin, at my sin. He's very angry. But he did something with that. He put it on Jesus. And Jesus suffered that man. Did Jesus know what he was doing? Yes, he knew what he was doing. Again and again, he, he would say, I've got to drink the cup. I've got to drink the cup of, of suffering, the cup of wrath of my Father. And he did. And that's the blessing we have as God's people. Yes, we're all guilty of anger. We all put faces on. We disguise it sometimes. But we all have it. But even though we have it, God loves us. Next Sunday we're going to talk about how to manage it. Which will be wonderful for us to get reminded of how we can manage it. But in the meantime, know that you're loved by God. God loves you. God sees your heart as it really is. And He loves you in your life. And today in the Lord's Supper, we're vividly reminded of what it took to establish that peace that God has with us. He took His body and His blood, shed on the cross for our sins because of love, His grace. In Jesus' name, Amen.